Georgian TV Film Company and Neo Studio present a documentary. General Shalikashvili. Produced by Manana Shevardnadze. Screenplay by Manana Shevardnadze and Amiran Gijinadze. Directed by Temur Chichladze. Director of Photography, Kogi Torazzi. Music by Gio Tsinsadze. Interviewed by Tamunda Mosashvili. Edited by Gia Pavlenishvili. Film editor Joseph Corintelli. Annapolis Naval Academy graduation ceremony, 1996. profound honor and privilege to introduce a leader among leaders, an extraordinary American, a soldier in the finest tradition of our great nation, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Shalikashvili. Please sit down, thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Secretary Dalton. Uh, it's an extraordinary introduction and I don't know where to begin other than to tell you that if it in fact is true that I chose the wrong service at the beginning, I hope at least I get some credit for wearing my white today. <laughs> 
Those of us who choose to wear America's uniform choose as well to live by a higher code of conduct and to surrender ourselves to public scrutiny. And that is entirely proper, for America entrusts the lives of its sons and daughters in our care. And America has a right to demand a full accounting of our stewardship. I'm proud to have you, and the nation is fortunate to have you. For in today's complex, crowded, and contentious world, America needs your talents, your energy, and your optimism. You see, on the one hand, we are safer today, now that the Cold War has passed into the pages of history. But on the other hand, the world is awash in failed states, regional conflicts, and the threat of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The old Chinese curse has come alive. We live in interesting times. In October 1993, General John M. Shalikashvili was appointed the 13th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. and Vice President of the United States. General Shali is superbly well qualified as I believe he has the ability to lead and to win any military action our nation might ask of him. Above all, I am confident that in every instance he will give me his absolutely candid and professional military advice, which as President I must have. He's widely known to his friends as General Sholley. And since we're going to be seeing a lot of each other and you're going to have to write a lot about him, I think I'll just start using the shortened. He is also a shining symbol of what is best about the United States and best about our armed services. General Sholley. bring Ukraine and Russia and other East European countries into NATO, sir? I have just been nominated for the position of chairman, not president of the United States. I, <laughs> <laughs> John M. Shalikashvili, do solemnly swear, you solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to end. The office on which I'm about to end. In October 1995, he was appointed for a second term of office, serving as the highest ranking military officer and the chief military advisor to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council that a first-generation immigrant would attain the top military post in the United States characterizes both the general himself and his adopted country. Recently, much has been written about the Shalikashvili's. Dmitry Shalikashvili's life in Poland and Germany is under study. Because of General Shalikashvili's distinguished career, Western press and television show keen interest in his ancestry. Who is he indeed? Where is he from? Why does a commander of the world's superpower have such a strange name? Growing up, who was your role model? Who did you want to be like? Oh, this, this will sound very ordinary when I tell you that, but my role model was my father. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I always, I guess like most children, uh, I uh, thought he was the most clever man and the, the, the wisest man. Uh, but he was also a very, very good man, very uh, kind man. So, uh, not just as a child, I think for many, many years afterwards. 
He was my role model. Well, as long as we're talking about your father, could you tell us a little bit about your family, your mother, your father, your, oh, we know you have an older brother. I'd be delighted to. I, uh, my, uh, my father, of course, was born in Georgia, um, ended up in the 1920s in uh, Poland, where he met my mother. When your father, all his life and throughout all my, my childhood and even later on, uh, although he lived in many different countries, uh, always first and foremost uh, stayed a Georgian and talked about it. His friends, uh, whether we lived in Europe or whether we lived here, the circle of friends that he had were Georgians. And so I'm, I'm used to having Georgians in my, in my house. And, and my memories of my childhood are with, you know, with, with Georgians around the house. Uh, and the discussions and uh, the writings that my father did about it. Uh, I think, uh, it's much deeper, much, much deeper than, for instance, on my mother's side, who was half Russian, half German. I think in my house, people, as I was growing up, we, the children, thought of ourselves as Georgians. And I was born in Warsaw, in Poland, when, uh, when my father was an officer in the Polish army. I guess I was three years old when World War II started. And we had um, not only did we watch the Germans come through, and then after the towards the end of the the war in a, in '44, as the Russians were approaching, uh, the Poles uh, had an uprising in Warsaw, and we were caught up in Warsaw, and where they are when when Warsaw was destroyed. Uh, we lived in Poland until I was uh, eight years old. And then the, in the fall of uh, 1944, when the uprising ended, we then uh, moved to Germany. Where we lived uh, until the end of the war, then in 1952 we immigrated from, from Germany to the United States. And that for me, of course, was then the start of a completely new life. I very quickly became very much an American in my thoughts and so. So 1952 when we came here, I guess it was, it was a pretty, pretty major event for me because that was the change from, from a European life to here to the United States. I came in uh, into the military as a soldier. I was uh, drafted into the military. Oh, I was uh, 21. I had just finished the university, and I uh, had no intention of coming into the military. No intention whatsoever. And I, uh, I uh, wanted to spend my two years in the military and then uh, go back to being an engineer, which is my training. But someone talked me into going to officer school, so I stayed. And then I... Um, once I became an officer, I was sent to Alaska. And I actually fell in love with the, with the military life. And um, so then I applied to stay. I think I never thought other than that I would stay in and I would retire as a colonel. And I had, from then on, a fairly normal career. I would, uh, you know, when we all went to Vietnam, I went to Vietnam, went to Korea. Uh, our son was born while we were stationed in Korea. Spent an awful lot of time in, in Europe, in, uh, Germany, in Italy, in Belgium. Um, 
and uh, uh, one thing led to another uh, and here I am. So I think other than that I didn't start out wanting to be here. It turned out to be a probably a fairly straightforward or linear, as you say, pretty straightforward career. Uh, and I have no regrets. It's been a, it's been a great life. in your life, personal or professional, any episodes you could recall that? I don't know. I think like with most of us is uh, getting married. Uh, that's obviously a key event. It's a uh, uh, when our son was born, key event. Um, probably most people would think going off to, to to Vietnam would be a key event, but I don't think for me it was. It was a, uh, it was something that as a soldier you just did. Uh, so uh, probably for me, uh, are the, the, the key events are the personal things that happened to my life. Getting married, having a son, uh, those were, those, I think those, if, if, if I were to reflect back on it, those would be the key events in my life. It was in the summer of 1966, and I was over in Europe visiting a friend of mine, a school teacher friend who taught school with John. And we had known each other at um, Oregon State, and we went to summer school together and decided when we both finished our degrees that I would meet over there and visit with her. And I was traveling around Europe, and we stopped in Kaiserslautern, and um, he asked us if we wanted to go out to dinner, and we said, sure. And he ordered dessert, and I thought, there's something right about this guy, because I like dessert, and it was the first dessert I'd had on the trip. So um, he just was a very, very nice, considerate person, and I really enjoyed life. I just really liked him very much. If there is a, uh, a person that, uh, that I uh, share thoughts with, and that I, uh, I feel the most uh, comfortable with, it's my wife. It's, uh, it's, if there's a person that uh, drives me when I sometimes become less resolute or not sure what to do, then that's her. I feel, I feel extremely comfortable with the life we've had and uh, cannot imagine having done what, what we did together if, if we had not been together. I enjoy uh, my life immensely. I, uh, I'm, if I had to do it over again, I would do, do the same thing. I'm sure there's, there's small things here and there almost every day that I wish I had done some other way. But there's no one great big thing that stands out and says, had I only not become a banker, I could have done something else with my life. I think I ended up doing with my life exactly what I would have hoped for my life would become. General Charlie is a chairman of many firsts. He's the first to come from Peoria. Bob Michael, I point that out to you. He's the first chairman who sounds like a cross between Pope John Paul II and John Wayne. But most important, General Charlie is the first chairman to take office after the Cold War. It's a new era, and Charlie is the right man for the job. In the new era, the United States no longer faces the monolithic Soviet threat. But we do face threats. And we face threats that are more varied and complex. As commander of our forces in Europe, Shali has already led some of our toughest post-Cold War missions. Do you think military mission could be humane? I don't know. Um... I think for a nation like the United States, um, 
with its global interests and with its global leadership responsibilities. The military exists to fight and win this nation's wars, wherever they occur. That's not a very humane thing from the way we think of the word humane. Uh, uh, and so uh, the military must be hard and it, it must be able to do the hard things. But there are, there are times when uh, only the military can, uh, can help bring humanity to a, to a tragedy. For instance, when a humanitarian disaster occurs somewhere. Take, a, uh, take places in Central Africa. Or, or, uh, my personal experience right after the uh, Gulf War when I was commander of an operation to uh, save uh, the Kurds in, in uh, northern Iraq. I think there are some humanitarian uh, situations that, that come about so quickly and so overwhelmed that normal humanitarian organizations that the military, particularly the United States military, is the only force that can come in and, uh, and bring, the, bring its power and its resources to bear to do something very humane. And we did that in, in uh, northern Iraq. We tried to do that in Somalia. We tried to do that, and I think fairly successful in a place like Rwanda or in Haiti. So in my life, and certainly in my time as chairman, we have used the military, which is, is not, first and foremost, a humane uh, business, to do humane things. So I think, yes, the, I think there, there is, but you have to be careful. The military, you have, you have to understand why the military exists, and it exists first and foremost to, to f to protect a nation, to protect its interests. In a case of a global nation like the United States, uh, with global interests, it has to be prepared to protect those interests in the far-flung corners of the world. And I think it does that very well. And so, here in the last few years, we have been able to bridge the, uh, the war fighting aspect, like in a Gulf War, and the humanitarian aspect, like, like a Kurdish operation or an African operation. These are uh, little uh, Kurdish kids in northern Iraq. And at the end of the Gold, uh, Gulf War, we, uh, uh, I went on an operation uh, because Saddam Hussein had chased hundreds of thousands of uh, of uh, uh, Kurdish uh, Iraqis into the mountains of eastern Turkey. And, uh, and there they were dying by the thousands. And so my task was to bring them back out of the mountains and, and to secure an area of, of Iraq. And these kids were, uh, uh, here they look now pretty good, but when we first found them in the mountains in, in Iraq, they were, Kids like that were in fact dying every night. And so when we brought them back and they started smiling again, someone took this picture and I, I've had it hanging here. And I guess that gets at the question that you asked earlier. Is there something humane about militaries? Do, do militaries do humane things? Things like that that militaries do. And what is interesting is to watch the faces of soldiers uh, who are trained to shoot rifles and tanks and, and whatnot. And when you take them on an operation like we did in Iraq, and they have a chance not to destroy, but to build something, to build a better life. It's, it's really it's a great feeling to, to watch how their eyes light up and, and with how much enthusiasm they throw themselves into a, into a task like that. So anyway, I've, I've kept this picture all, all the time. Memorial Day.
7, 1945. The war in Europe was over. There had never been a war like it. But for all its tragedy, its inhumanity, for all its terrible costs and its frightful consequences, it brought out the best in all of us as well. It brought us together, dozens of nations forming the largest military alliance in the history of the world. Millions of young men and young women from all walks of life, of all colors, of all religions, from every nation whose flag will be raised here today. We were unified. Our purpose was clear, unequivocal, resolute. We were engaged in a noble crusade, and the fate of mankind hung in a balance. Well, their nature, which countries will go to war, if there are going to be any? Right well, I think that's a very hard uh, question because uh, we have to be very careful that we don't pretend that we know something that we don't know. Uh, but I think that as you th think forward to the, uh, to the next century, uh, I think uh, at least the first uh, few years will be probably very much like they are now. It won't be any easier. I think um, all the, the various uh, forces that have been unleashed as a result of the end of the Cold War, uh, the religious intolerances, the long suppressed hatreds that existed, the, uh, the kind of nationalism that bubbles up everywhere. I think that's still going to be with us. And so the, uh, the kind of conflicts we have seen in the last uh, uh, five years or so, since the end of the Cold War, whether they are the uh, Bosnias of today or of tomorrow, I think they'll still be, uh, be with us. And someone, someone will have to ensure that these regional crises don't boil into some, something bigger. So I think there will be a requirement for the community of nations. Have you ever experienced fear? And if yes, in what kind of situation? I think all of us experience fear. Uh, people, I guess when you ask a soldier about fear, you ask, you know, have you had fear in combat or whatever? I guess you get scared. But you, get, you have experienced fear in your everyday life. Uh, a child is afraid when he goes to take an exam in school. Uh, I'm sure that the moments when you on your job or at home, you feel fear. I think we all feel fear. I think only stupid people don't feel fear. Uh, I think what's important is not whether you feel fear or not, it's whether that paralyzes you, keeps you from doing what you need to do. I, I have always been a little bit afraid of uh, height. And so early on, I, I uh, wanted to make sure that I would become a paratrooper to find out whether I could stand on that airplane and jump out or whether I would be too afraid to do so. Uh, it's not something I enjoy doing, but I've done it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I think fear, sometimes, if you can control it, makes you do great things. Uh, it gives you a, 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 a kind of an energy to get things done. And or it can paralyze you if you're, if you're not careful. As a military person, have you ca ever carried out an order that you didn't believe was right? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. I think um, you have to make a distinction. Some things uh, you don't quite agree with, you don't quite like, uh, but you do them, and I've done that. But there are issues that you so disagree with that go against your conscience. 
that you think so fundamentally wrong. And then I think you have to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and uh, uh, you must not fall in a trap of, of hiding behind the fact that you're a soldier and that no matter what they tell you to do, you're going to do it. At least in our military, we have a, uh, we teach our soldiers never to obey an order that they think is illegal or immoral. So we, we work very hard, not just to teach our soldiers to obey orders, but also to teach them what kind of orders not to obey. I think when you get into a job like I have, it's important that you understand uh, what you think is so wrong that you ought to really resign before doing it. Fortunately, I haven't, I haven't run into that. But on a much smaller scale, I think when you're a young officer, someone says, do this, you always say, gosh, there's a better way of doing it. But if you can't convince your boss to do it the other way, then you go ahead and do it. I think a good command climate is one where a subordinate has the right to tell his superior that I don't agree, why don't we do it this way? If, if there's a command climate where, where there's, there's, the relationship is good enough where you can say that, and then the subordinate can say, thank you very much, but no, we're going to do it my way. End of discussion. It is only when, when people are afraid, when, when, the, when the boss sets that kind of a climate that the subordinates are afraid to, to say, no, I, I think that may be wrong or maybe there's a better way to do. That's when the whole organization starts getting into trouble. So I think as a senior officer, I have a, I have a responsibility to make sure that the climate is always there, that people can say to me, mm -mm, this, you know, wait a minute, shouldn't we do it the other way? You have to ask others whether I've been able to create that climate or not, but that's the kind of climate I like. Uh, he's a joy to work with. Of all of the general officers that I've worked for, um, he has a very nice personality, and he's very approachable. If I have any kind of uh, problems, and since I deal with the news media, I have problems every day, it's very easy for me to go see him and talk to him about those problems. Okay. Um, can, what are some of his most prominent personality uh, traits, professional as well as personal? Well, I think one of the most important things is that uh, he listens. And if something happens, uh, some generals that you work for, some generals, it's not that way. Um, they would rather just be talking to you, or we like to say in the broadcast mode all the time. But with General Shawley, he listens and he asks many questions, and I think it helps him make a better decision. General John M. Shalakashvili, in his own words, is a symbol of what America is really all about. I am especially proud to present to you General John M. Shalakashvili, Class of 1958, for the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree.
course of your career, you've met many prominent and interesting people. Who stands out the most? Who impressed you the most? Oh gosh, it's hard to say because there are so many. Um, I don't, you know, I don't say that because uh, because you are here. Uh, but certainly, uh, certainly President Shevardnadze is one of those. Probably have a vision of him uh, that's greater than that. Have a vision of what he did when he was the foreign minister. And uh, how much he had to do with moving, moving us from, from an era of confrontation, East and West. Uh, to an era which, which hopefully exists today, an era of cooperation. Uh, I think he had an enormous part in that. And so uh, the relations that he, that he established between himself and Secretary Baker and Schultz before him, these kind of relationships that allowed uh, the Soviet Union and, uh, and the United States to begin to bridge great divides that they had. And I think made possible the end of the Cold War. The world really thinks of, uh, of Edward Shevardnadze in those terms. I think we've had three major upheavals this century. Uh, world War I, World War II, and the Cold War. And so uh, uh, it's only the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, that has completed that period and that has now allowed us the chance to transition from this century into the next one with a much higher hope that this next century is going to be a lot better than the century we're leaving behind. And so the men that, that were there and helped fashion the end of the Cold War have, have certainly earned a very special place in the history of the century. Ilya II, Catholicos Patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Our people are proud of you. Your family is well known in Georgia. Probably the most important thing for myself and for my brother is just the knowledge that we can both return here to the land where our father was born. That I'm sure that uh, today my father is looking down from heaven I must feel very happy that he sees his two sons back in Georgia. To a toast to this uh, remarkable monument, uh, this church here, that never again uh, should the enemies of Georgia be able to come here and uh, lay a hand and bring destruction to the church. May it always remain like this in peace. To this great monument of Georgia. The Shalikashvili's are descended from Georgian nobility. Ancient Georgian manuscripts refer to them as excellent warriors and resilient people. Ever since the 14th century, the Shalikashvili's have been on the front line in numerous battles fought in defense of Mescheti, the southern part of Georgia. After the south part of Georgia was conquered by the Turks, the Shalikashvili scattered, settling in various regions of Georgia. Later, almost all Shalikashvili men served in the Russian army. General's grandfather, 
two great uncles, his father and his uncle, all were high-ranking officers. At the beginning of the 19th century, General Shalikashvili's great-great-grandfather, Joseph, married the daughter of Kachetian nobleman Andronikashvili and received part of his estate in dowry. Later, he bought lands from the Chavchawadze family. Thus, the Shalikashvili estate appeared in the heart of Kacheti. John's father, Dmitry Shalikashvili, regarded himself a Kahetian. He had only seen his grandfather's ancestral home from the window of a train. Dmitry's love for his homeland had been endued by his widowed mother. Since childhood I have prayed to God for George's survival, Dmitry Shalikashvili wrote in his memoirs. On May 26, 1918, I felt that God had answered my prayers. I resumed it, however, in 1921, and have never seized them again. Dmitry and his elder brother David clashed with the Red Army on the outskirts of Tbilisi. As to what happened next is commonly known. Together with Georgia's first government, the Shalikashvili brothers landed up in Istanbul. Georgia only remained for them in their dreams. When you come here, you find out how true it is. The Georgians are very special people. They're very warm people and very friendly people and very hospitable people. And even if the times are difficult, uh, they do not uh, spare at all that warm feeling that, uh, that they have for others. So uh, it, uh, every man at one time in his life should be able to come here and draw strength for being with Georgians.
Obviously, I have um, a, uh, a dagger and a sword from, from Georgia uh, that uh, your grandfather gave me. And it's, uh, it's been here. Above that is a, uh, it's a sword from the Polish cavalry that my, uh, my father's. This was a great moment in my life, and this is, of course, a great memory of my, my life. Thank you.